Whilst this is a review of the Sony PXW FX9, and I'm going to call it just the FX9 for now because that's way too much of a mouthful, it is going to be looking at features that we've wanted or didn't know we want in cameras over the years because I've done so many reviews and we're always looking for something that ticks all the boxes, always looking for that perfect camera. Is this the perfect camera? Well, spoiler alert, it's not. Why? Because no matter what any manufacturer will give us, we'll always want something else. But just how close does the FX9 come to that mythical thing? I asked social media what's the most important factors when uh, looking to get a new camera. And I got a lot of responses, and they were very interesting. On the Facebook FX9 user group, at the top was dynamic range, and then high frame rate, which was interesting, and then color, the variable ND, a full frame sensor switchboard to Super 35. Autofocus is down there. Further down the list, we have raw internal recording, 6K or higher resolution. Superb audio capabilities should be a lot higher. Very surprising to me was global shutter being very far down the list. Three or four years ago, that would have been a lot higher. I think people have just gotten used to CMOS. On Twitter, I had hundreds of replies. And for the most part, they were very similar responses. Dynamic range being very high up, as was full frame. And actually, autofocus was mentioned quite a few times. It is impossible to define what is a perfect camera because everybody has different needs. And even if manufacturers put in everything that we asked for, then we'd ask for something more. You give us 4K 120 frames per second, then we'll ask for it to be 6K. You give us 6K 120 frames per second, then we'll ask for 6K 240 frames per second. You get the idea. Certainly for me, when it comes to features that I look for in a dedicated video camera, the image quality is essential. So that does combine things like dynamic range, color science, resolution is very important. I do need 4K or higher. A great codec with 10 bit internal recording is very important. And autofocus has become one of the key features I'm looking for these days as well. And interestingly, not many people talked about the lens mount, the switchability of the lens mount, because I actually think that is actually really important. Even if you can't switch the lens mount, the ability to put on other types of lenses, I think is very important. Ease of use is actually one of the highest things for me. Something that isn't too complicated, has really nice simple menus, simple operation. Another spoiler alert, the FX9 isn't the easiest camera to use as it has lots and lots and lots of options. It's just a bit of a learning curve. My FS7 review, which came out in May 2015, was about 42, 43 minutes. And I did actually cover a huge amount in that, but I also had the camera for a lot longer. I used it for the wonder list and all sorts of stuff, so I had a lot of footage. Whereas this review doesn't have anywhere near as varied footage and doesn't cover as many things but what it does cover I cover in much more detail what I wanted to do was focus on the real differences between the FS7 and the FX9 the things that would make you or I want to buy this camera whether we are upgrading from an FS7 or it's appealing as a first dip into the Sony video camera world If you are the sort of person who gets bothered by bad continuity, I'm sorry now. I have no control over my cats. You know, sometimes I could have, you know, like three or four in a big lump there, and now I have none, which uh, is probably worst case scenario for me. It's nice to have that company. But I'm editing in my edit switch, which is where I am now, or doing these things to camera. I made that decision to have them in the frame. I could have framed them out, but I didn't. So I'm apologizing right now for that terrible continuity. I've always felt it's important to have context when it comes to these sort of reviews because not everybody's going to know my background. A bit about 
how I got to this position, how I got to this camera, my journey. So when I explain my thoughts and opinions, you do understand them a bit better because they may be quite different to yours because you may have, a, and probably do have a very different sort of background to me. But understanding that context will really help you. So a quick recap of my history, in case you don't know. 17 years working in TV news in England, um, traveling the world and doing all sorts of wonderful and awful stories in G cameras. So broadcast two third inch on the shoulder type stuff. Freelance for the past 14 years, doing all sorts of things, but mostly documentaries. Of course, the DSLR revolution came along then and I embraced that fully. I love that full frame image. Super 35 mil uh, cameras came along, which were finally affordable and, you know, were terrific. And we've been on quite a journey with them. There's so many different cameras. It's two knockouts and maybe three or four stopped in the first round. <laughs> You don't go clubbing, drinking, smoking. Not for me. It's better doing boxing than doing those things. A really key player in a story is the Sony PXW FS7, and I will be dropping that PXW as well. A really important camera that came into my life in about November 2014. Now, of course, the moment I put Harriet down, I am going to be completely covered in white hair. So, you're going to stay here? Good. So, prior to that camera, the most expensive cameras I've been using, uh, well, I bought a Red Epic in 2011, 2012, I think. Then, after that, I got a C300, and then the Sony F55, which was a beast of a camera. And I was using that initially to film the CNN documentary series, The Wonderlist. And that was in, well, from about September 2014 was when I first started shooting that show. And it was and still is a really terrific camera. Slightly overkill for what I needed, to be honest with you. And that's why when the FS7 came out and ticked the boxes I needed, which was 4K 60p, some nice high frame rate in HD, which is up to 180 frames per second. It's not that it was a better camera than the F55, uh, because it, it wasn't. It was very similar image-wise it was lighter. The key thing for me, it was lighter with most of the same features. I could use smaller batteries as well. From the worldwide reach of CNN, journalist Bill Weir and filmmaker Philip Bloom comes a quest to tell the untold stories of extraordinary people places, cultures, and creatures that are at a crossroads. Will they choose tradition, embrace progress, or just fade away? The Wonder List with Bill Weir, coming soon, only on CNN. And I think I've shot some of the best stuff of my career with that camera. It's not surprising because of the places and opportunities that I had to actually use this camera. Just mind-blowingly incredible. And it was also a pretty solid camera when it came to reliability. It actually only went wrong twice and both times were right at the beginning of its life and both of them were avoidable the first one was the very first day i got it put it out onto my kitchen table and i nipped into the office where i am now 
to get, I don't even know what it was. I, just, I was gone for like a minute, maybe two minutes maximum. And I came back and my beloved Noodle, who sadly left me a couple of years ago, she had chewed through the EVF cable in that very short period of time. So it's my own fault. I should have not have left the camera out. I actually just absolutely adored chewing cables. And the way that it's designed is still on the FX9 is it's not a cable that can be detached from the LCD screen. It, the whole thing needs replacing. And the other issue I had was I was filming in the floods of Venice and I got it splashed. I wasn't careful enough. I didn't have any waterproof cover over it. It is a splash proof camera, but it was a big splash and one of the circuit boards got fried. After that, no more issues. Rock solid. It became my main documentary camera for a number of years after that, so much so that I did sell the F55 because I just didn't need it for the type of work that I was doing. The F F7 did it all. But there's always a couple of things which weren't ideal about the camera. One, which was important at the time and one which became important later on. The first thing being the low light performance of the camera was never great. It was never a really clean image. It's always needed some work in post to get the best out of it. But in low light, it definitely did struggle. You know, you could shoot a 3200 ISO and it was all right. And 6400 was pushing it with some noise reduction. It looked fine. But I always just wanted it to be cleaner straight off, to have a nicer looking image without having to do too much work in post. The second thing wasn't an issue when I first started getting it. It became something important later on. And that was its ability to autofocus, which basically was zero. Contrast based, it was utterly unusable. I didn't need it initially, but once I started using cameras with autofocus, it became such a useful and practical tool, especially when doing talking heads interviews and also tracking subjects. And Sony video cameras, the large sensor video cameras were just incapable of having anything, anything close to usable autofocus because it was all contrast based. The only video cameras with large sensors that were any good with autofocus were from Canon. Sony stills cameras were getting better and better. The A7R2 was, I think, the first time I saw pretty good autofocus in video, and it's gotten better and better and better. But not for the video cameras. And also, these are full frame cameras, and I love full frame going back to that DSLR revolution, wanting that full frame video camera, wanting a full frame video camera with great autofocus and much better performance in low light. Can I even say great performance in low light? Oh, that brings us on to this camera, the FX9. In September 2019, I got invited to the launch of a new professional large sensor video camera from Sony. They didn't tell me what it was and I didn't find out exactly the name of it and the features until I got there. The first day was going through and listening and watching PowerPoint presentations and having a quick look at it. They very much emphasized that the FX9 was not a replacement for the FS7, FS7 Mark II. It was a separate camera above those and they would still be making and selling the FS7 cameras. On the second day, there was a few of us who had a chance to actually shoot with the camera. We had about two to three hours or so and we could take the footage back, which was great. But this was literally my first chance of using the camera. And one of the first things you do when you get your hands on a new camera is try and understand the setup of it. But I didn't want to just start filming straight away. I needed to know the camera a bit more, understand the menus, get the settings right, which probably took about half of the time that I was actually allotted to have the camera. Pretty annoying to the guys from Sony Japan because I was asking so many questions. Can I do this? How do I do this? Can I do this? Whilst the menus are very similar to the FS7, there is some differences. 
but nothing major. And that's one of the things that would be so nice if Sony could go and change completely because this is a menu system which feels very, very, very old. It's time to have a new interface, a much nicer, slicker, cleaner, more customizable interface. When I finally got everything up and running, I did decide I really wanted to concentrate on the autofocus especially, and to see what that image looks like. One of the headline features of the FX9 is this new color science. Cause you know, a lot of people will criticize the Sony color science and say, oh, the Canon one's so much better, or blah, blah, blah. Look, if you can know how to color grade, you can make anything look like anything. And I never had any major problems. That being said, the look out of camera from the FX9 was so much nicer. All this footage you're seeing was shot using the S-Cinetone profile. So normally I would shoot everything in log, S-Log3, uh, S-Gamut3, Cine, I think it's called with the camera but this was a big thing having this venice look even if it was a much more contrasty more saturated baked in look something that wouldn't require grading i'd never really film in that sort of way it looked so nice and the autofocus did really well i was mostly shooting with the 50 mil 1.4 sony zeiss planar which is actually what i am being filmed on right now and the 70, the 200, uh, I think I did use a wide angle at some point as well. And of course I was using wide open for most of it to see you know, just how well it could work. I didn't know the autofocus settings at all uh, compared to what I do know now. And I will be going through those in depth, super, super in depth later on in the video. <laughs> In mid-November, Sony lent me the camera for a couple of weeks so I could make a review based upon the pre-release firmware, like a first review type thing, before the camera was shipped and everybody had it. And that was my original plan, so that was what my video was going to be. Of course, that didn't happen because, you know, you're watching this now and it's, it's a different type of video, mainly because the camera shipped basically at the same time I gave the camera back. So while I spent all that time filming was potentially out of date. Not necessarily, it's just that the camera was shipping with version one firmware and I shot with 0.5. Even though this camera that I'm using right now has version 1.0, it is still missing lots of things which are coming to this camera in the future in firmware updates. They have a roadmap for what's coming. And there will be stuff which will be added which isn't actually on there right now. But some of the key things that are missing right now that of course we want is there is no full frame slow motion. Not yet. There will be in version two, although that still won't be the full sensor. It will have a slight crop, which is a little bit disappointing, but that is coming in the version two firmware. If you need a 50p, 60p, you need to drop into super 35 mil mode. And right now our high frame rate in HD is limited to 120 frames per second, whereas the FS7 went up to 180. So that is something else that we are waiting for in the firmware. So all I can test is what is in this camera. There's lots more to come and lots of things from using this camera that I would love them to add in there. 
and again I will be going through them in this video. This review is using stuff that I shot for that initial filming with the 0.5 firmware and the rest of it is with the version 1. The sun's really low. I think I've missed it. Certainly, I'll get the sunset colour, but I'm not going to get any direct sunlight. So this will be my first Sony FX9 shot. Okay. Two-handed operation with this lens mount compared to the standard e-mount. Oh, that's my lens cap already. 17 minutes till sunset. I'm not going to get the daylight comparison shots that I wanted to do between the different profiles. I'm shooting in S-Cinetone right now in the custom mode, which is what I used when I first used the camera a couple of months ago. I wanted to see how, well I will see how S-Log3, etc. compares to it, just not today, because I want it with daylight. I want to see that dynamic range and everything. So I will have to come back maybe tomorrow, but at least I can do some testing with uh, low light. And low light is one of the key things to me that I need this camera to be good at. So I'll make the most of it and do some autofocus testing as well, see how well different lenses and the adapted lenses work uh, in low light autofocus. I'm actually using autofocus right now, of course, and it is on face only. So in theory, when I step out of frame, it should stay this sort of shallowness in the background and not revert onto the background. Here goes. Did it work? Yeah. That's good, isn't it? That works pretty well. I don't even know what setting speed I set it to. If I switch to face priority, so I am the priority of course, but if I step out it will revert to the background. Nobody wants that, do they? There is another way of stopping it reverting onto the background and I will show you that when we do some uh, what, following people shots and tracking shots because especially if it's the back of the head, it won't recognize that as a face because it's not, it's the back of the head. So anyway, I'm waffling, bye. The lever locking E-mount was introduced on the FS7 Mark II. I never considered upgrading my FS7 to this camera because it was basically that and the Rebel ND. And when I was first using it, I found it really fiddly. The great thing about the E-mount is it's so easy to change lenses one-handed which is basically how I change lenses, because it's mostly just me. Unless I'm lucky enough to have an assistant, it's always going to be me changing lenses. So it is a case of remove the lens using both hands, put it down, leaving the lens mount open to any dust that can get in there. Pick up a new lens, put it in. I've gotten more used to it now, and I've kind of found a way of holding a lens under my arm and doing it that way. I don't recommend it, because the chances of you dropping a lens is quite high but it means I can change lenses pretty quickly. The upside with the lever mount, the lens feels so much more secure. So whilst it's fiddlier, it's definitely worth it. I used the Atomus Ninja 5 to record the screen information so you could see the settings and what was going on with the autofocus. The camera is capable of sending out 4K 10 bit via the HDMI. So if you want to record in ProRes, obviously take off all of that stuff on the screen. You may think, yeah, I do know that. Well, somebody did email me once and said they accidentally recorded everything that was on the menus and they asked how they could remove it. I broke the bad news to them that you can't. You're just gonna have to crop in. As I've already mentioned, I'll be going through autofocus a lot in this video and there'll be dedicated tests. But just here, I just wanna introduce you to something. On this shot here, the FX9 has picked up this gentleman because he was the biggest face in the frame. 
in phase priority mode. And yes, I'm still in HD, whoops. And on a ninja, you can see the white box shows that it is tracking him and the yellow line beneath is a cursor because when there's other faces, you can then move that cursor with your D-pad on the camera. The most important tip I can give you is when using autofocus and tracking people is make sure you have a shortcut on your camera for focus hold. By default, it is set to some native lenses on the actual lens itself, but just put it on the camera on an easily accessible shortcut button. So when you get to that point where you want him to exit frame, hold down focus hold, and the focus motor will hold just there. Otherwise, it will revert onto the background. When you're on a crowd and you have face tracking on it, it's gonna get a little bit confused, especially if people are walking across each other. That's where face registration mode would come in for this. So to use face registration, you simply press select when you have a box around somebody and then you get a double box. So now it will not focus onto any of these other faces, even though there's like four faces there. It should stay on this lady. Doesn't always work. There's occasions where it might lose them. And when it does lose that focus, the focus motor should hold in that position until it sees your registered face again. It's not foolproof but it is the only way you can stop it getting confused with lots of faces in the frame. I filmed everything in s -Cine tone still, nothing using the Cine EI mode or the log. The only way at this point to get 50p or 60p in 4K is in Super 35mm mode. This will change when we get version 2 firmware. Because the camera has dual sensitivity ISO, so it has a base ISO of 800, which is the low mode, and 4000, which is the high mode, both of these should have pretty much the same amount of noise. And it looked incredibly clean. If you are needing to push your ISO up in the low mode, you may well be better off shooting in the high ISO mode and bringing it down a little bit because it's going to be cleaner. 3200 ISO using the low mode is noisier than 3200 ISO in the high base ISO. I've been mostly focusing, forgive the pun, on autofocus. And for the most part, it's worked really well. And that isn't just with native lenses. Right now I'm on the 35 1.8 and it's great. But I've also used the Sigma 105 1.4 quite a lot with the MC11 adapter because it's an EF mount version. And it's worked really well too. A lot of stuff with the 70 200 28 GM really good the only issue that i've really had is with that face tracking it gets confused a lot of people i feel like i have selected somebody but it, it somebody goes across and even though it's in the locked on mode which is the sensitivity number one and i think i'm gonna have to move but other than that it's performed really really impressively even a you know wide open and even on adaptive glass uh, i wasn't doing some low light test tonight but i've used all my batteries i had three big batteries and they've all gone down it's definitely a thirstier camera than my fs7 for sure so i think i do have one more battery in the car so what i might do is pack up from here and head off down to richmond lock where i can park 
right by a place I can film and just get some last shots and just push our ISO up high. I think right now I'm at 4,000 and that previous shot where I had light on me was at the uh, 800 sensitivity and we are at a cine tone. So yeah, are we just checking? Yeah, it is. This is a very common way of testing out low light performance and it's fine. But if you want to see what noise levels are really like, what you need to do is shoot in normally lit places and push up the ISO there and just compensate with your shutter speed or your ND, of course. So that's what I'm going to do for my next low light test anyway. And I'm going to see if I can make these skin tones look a bit better with a white balance. I mean, this is natural. This is what it looks like here with these halogens. Outside my house, I have LEDs and uh, whilst they're not particularly nice color, they're great for filming in because you actually get color. But let's see what I can do with white balance. Ah. Oh, very blue now. pushed it up a little bit so now a little bit better it needs to be a little bit orange because that's what the natural light actually is I really would recommend trying to get your white balance done in camera especially in extreme light like this whilst you can do it in post it will degrade the image but still try and make sure you get a reference white like an x white color checker but if you do it in camera you're actually going to get much better results and that image isn't going to fall apart as much. by far the most time consuming and at times very frustrating part of the review tests has been autofocus. A big chunk is gonna be that. Yeah, there will be autofocus in the video, you've already seen quite a few bits already. But if you're not interested in autofocus, well, you're missing out. It is an amazing technology that is very good. It's not perfect and there's a lot of quirks going on in this camera when it comes to the autofocus. I took the time to make these tests so at least you could just watch them and if you get bored you can always scrub through. Don't know. It make me cry. <laughs> I just want to take this moment to explain why I think autofocus is an incredibly important thing and one of the most, if not the biggest, feature of this camera. Quite frequently when I talk about it online, I get met with, ah, oh, autofocus is for amateurs, it's not for professionals. Poppycock, any tool that can be used to help us and make our life easier whilst filming should be embraced. Autofocus has been on a journey, a very slow journey. My very first video camera in 1987, or oh, 86, was a Video 8 from Sony, had autofocus, and I've had many, many cameras since then. And apart from the ENG cameras for news, they all had autofocus, and they were all shit, utterly unusable. 
There's no point having autofocus if it doesn't work. Autofocus in video needs to be accurate, smooth, and reliable. You need to be able to trust it. You won't be surprised to learn I get ridiculous comments on social media, things like, well, if your production can't afford a focus puller, you shouldn't be doing it. Well, this may be new to some people, but not everybody works in narrative fiction or high-end commercials where you get a focus puller. I've probably had a focus puller maybe four times in 30 years. It's not often. Most of the time it's me with my hand on the barrel of the lens. The problem we have is the larger the sensors have got, the harder it has become to make sure our focus is accurate. The ability to have a shallow depth of field is very, very easy to get, even at smaller f-stops, meaning to get accurate focus, you need to be pretty damn good on your focus barrel. You need to have a great EVF and great focus assist tools. Even then, it's still hard, especially as the majority of us who are using these large sensor cameras are using photographic lenses, which are not the greatest for any manual focus. Most of them have infinity focus rings with no hard stops. Some of them aren't even linear. They're focused by wire, which means trying to get manual focus accurately is incredibly hard. If there's tools like autofocus which can help us, then great. I don't use autofocus for everything, it's just for certain situations. I won't say the words it will never replace manual focus because never is a big word. What about in 500 years time where we just use our thoughts to change focus? Who knows, that could be sooner. In that present day and in the foreseeable future, it's not going to replace manual focus. It's not going to replace focus pullers. It's just going to be an incredibly useful tool for certain situations. Things which are added into cameras are there to help us. Yeah, autofocus is a big one. So is dynamic range. But things like viewing LUTs, there to help us. Waveforms are there to help us get exposure. How about a spirit level in the viewfinder so you know you're not on the squiff? If you're gonna go old school, get them all removed. I don't need that, I don't need that. I've got a light meter, I know what I'm level. To be totally blunt, if you think like that, you're being a bit of an idiot. Just remember, autofocus isn't just a switch you turn on and everything is magically perfect. Like everything, it takes skill and manual focus is still there and it's what I use most of the time. It is a hybrid system of phase detection for the speed and smoothness and contrast for the accuracy. The problem is certain types of contrast do cause issues. If you've ever tried to get autofocus on somebody with a really bright background, even if you've got great phase detection autofocus, because it does use contrast as well, it will struggle. As my lovely Jimmy the Greek is a black cat and the background is much brighter, it does cause issues. What I could do is throw more light on him, uh, darken the background, and it would work a lot better. But this will happen whether it's a black cat or a person with a bright background. So these are the sort of issues you need to be thinking about when using autofocus. Oh, this bag is too heavy. So I need to do more tests. So that's what I'm heading off to do right now is see my friends Julian and Guy at their production company, Terralon Media in Wandsworth, which is about seven miles from me. So yeah, in London terms, at this time of day, it's not too bad. Hi, hey, you see you. Did that, you just covered my camera. Oh my God. So I mean, it's really heavy, don't do that. You probably got a bad back. Oh no, that's me. Oh my God. Number one rule about getting off is, Ground floor. <laughs> oh, it's warm. You can see I have lots of different lenses. It wasn't about the types of lenses and the adapted lenses I wanted to see here. This is coming in the next big test. Guys never look better. That's saying something. I wanted to see how well 
that face only tracking worked. So if you're on somebody's face and you lose them, does it hold in that position? Way more control than doing it out in the crowd in the town center with controlled subjects that I can actually direct. Well, sort of. Most of the time I'm just gonna be on the main Atomus Inferno screen because it shows you all the information. And I'm doing this in slow motion so I can go through this shot in particular. It's autofocus, face only. Not registration because there's two people I want to go from. Because in face registration, it would ignore the person who's not registered. It sees Guy, as you can see from the square, perfect. And as I pan off of him, the focus motor disengages because it's lost the face. It only re-engages when it reaches Julian and it recognizes another human face. Just at that point, Julian turns around, so it loses the face. Again, the focus motor holds in that position. It doesn't revert onto anything else. If there was another person in the frame, ah, then it would probably go onto them. In which case, I would most likely press the focus hold button because I don't want it to go onto them. I just need to wait for Julian to be a face again. And when he turns around after he's done his Instagram story, it picks him up again and we are working. Perfect result. The camera desperately needs the LCD screen to be touch enabled so you can select who you want to be in focus. You know, like the Sony stills cameras. I have heard though that this actually is a touch screen. Whether it can be enabled, I don't know, but it would make things so much easier. Right now you've got to use the flexible spot mode, which is actually on one of my shortcuts. So you move the cursor. It's easier to do it on the joystick, which is on the hand grip. But if you're not on that side of the camera, you use the D-pad on the side. And it does work, it's just not ideal. It'll be much easier to just touch the screen. I don't actually know what constitutes a face for Sony, so I decided to try and draw my own. I didn't know Sony was an art critic. I thought that was pretty accurate as a face, but apparently not. <laughs> the cheesy, what are they called? The cheesy curly, Flavor cheesy potato curly snack. potato snack. This sort of silliness is the perfect way to do these sort of tests. They are controlled, but they're real world as well. I can imagine many, many shoots where this sort of particular situation would come up. Well, maybe not exactly this, but this sort of unpredictability is definitely a big thing. What you don't want is for the autofocus to just be going off onto the background and getting completely confused. Otherwise, you would have to go manual focus and you wouldn't stand a hope in hell of nailing it. So it seemed adding a little bit more facial hair meant that the Sony now considered my drawing to be essentially photorealistic. Two equally handsome visages. I think the hair is a bit nicer on my drawing. <laughs> I mean, look, can you tell which is the human being there and which is my drawing? Today was very much an educational day. I know you can see the fun, but it was educational in I got to know this camera a lot better because I'm in a controlled situation with the same subject and playing with the settings and figuring out what is well what works best it's it is a journey of discovery when you using a new camera so I haven't even looked at the stuff yet it's uh, about two and a half cards so that's only 128 gig and another 64 so yeah. I probably shot about 150 gigs so it's not too bad a lot less than yesterday You had a nice day? What have you been up to? 
I've been filming. Mostly autofocus again. I know. No, there's no animal eye autofocus on this. Sorry. Maybe one day. You never know. The FX9 is the first full-frame camera to get an electronic variable ND. First introduced in the FS5 and then the FS7 Mark II, it makes getting your perfect exposure so much easier. Other cameras with built-in ND have fixed amounts. It could be a filter wheel or another way of implementing it. You can use the FX9 in that traditional way with three fixed presets, but you can actually define how much ND you want on each one. But the best way by far is using Vrebel ND. And there's a dedicated switch on the FX9 to go between the preset modes and variable ND mode. My shots can have the exact depth of field that I want because I have far more control over my settings. My shutter speed can remain the same, the ISO can be what I want it to be, and I just dial in the amount of ND until I get my exposure. And it is implemented in a better way than the previous two cameras. Now when you turn the ND off, you have a clear piece of glass which not only protects the sensor, but maintains our back focus on our lenses. Whereas on the other two cameras, when you turn the ND off, it was completely open. This way, much better. And it protects the sensor. We all know what a focus pull is. Here is one for you. And this is done manually, so it's almost spot on, but good enough. One of the cool things you can do with a camera with variable ND is a depth of field pull. So right now we're super shallow. I'm going to increase my depth of field so you can see a little bub. It's a pretty easy thing to do. You simply put your variable ND into auto mode. You do need to have a lens with a smooth iris. Absolutely. So when you start wide open and then you close down your iris, then your depth field will increase and you'll see the background much more, but of course it gets much, much darker. So the idea is that the variable ND will compensate for that. There's a few bits of fiddling with settings. So when you're wide open, you should have the maximum amount of variable ND in. And then when you close down, it will go to its minimum amount of ND. The lens that I'm using has a seven stop range, 1.4 to f16. The variable ND of the camera is a five stop control. It does have seven stops in total, but when you get down to the least amount, that is two stops. And then if you want to have more light, you have to turn off the variable ND. So there's no control over those first two stops. So basically you have a window of five stops. If you do try and close down your iris, You'll see that as I go past that five stops, I end up two stops underexposed. So you'll need to limit yourself to those five stops. There is a way around that, and that means having something else auto on, which basically is going to be the ISO. Getting your settings right for this is a bit fiddly, but after a bit of experimenting, you can make it work. So I basically set my auto ISO max to be two stops higher than what I had it set for the non-auto ISO, if that makes sense. You may be asking, this is all very cool, but what's the point of it? Well, think about it. The way that we draw attention to something in the frame normally is to have a shallow depth of field. By starting off with a deeper depth of field and making it shallower as part of the shot, we are drawing the viewer's attention to that person in the frame. And alternatively, we could be doing it as a reveal, so showing more of the background. A focus pull is about changing the attention from one thing to another. But with a depth of field pull, we're still on that same subject, and that can have a very powerful impact on your shot. If I haven't convinced you yet, this will. The Unique system uses a motor on the iris to change depth of field. 
and our variable ND filter automatically keeps exposure constant, enabling a novel form of cinematic expression. And five years from retirement. It isn't personal, Mike. Your salary benefit package is too much against your return. You work hard, you play by the rules, you're a good soldier and you don't deserve it. But the reality is sometimes soldiers end up casualties. <laughs> Even though there's loads of cats behind me, it won't focus onto those because it is for humans only. Some of the stills cameras from Sony do recognize animals for stills mode, but not in video. Hopefully that will come and it works really, really well. But it does need to be a human face for it to work. So that's why this section is called, what exactly is a human face? I mentioned earlier how important I think it is to have either interchangeable lens mounts or a lens mount that works across all sorts of different types of lenses with adapters. The E-mount is one of the most flexible lens mounts out there. I don't mean flexible in a bendy way, especially with the new lever lock, it's really quite the opposite of that. As long as the lens that you want to use has a larger flange than the E-mount, with an adapter, of course, because if it's just a little bit bigger than the E-mount, it's not going to work. You've got to get an adapter in there. And as long as it covers the sensor, you're going to be able to use it. Whether you can use the electronics or not, that is a different thing. With more and more mirrorless cameras out there, so there are now different types of lenses out there with flanges, which are about the same or even smaller, you really cannot use these on this camera. Sorry. I've already talked about my love of full frame and for many years on Sony video cameras we have been able to get a full frame look using the Metabone Speed Booster. I first used them on the FS100, the FS700 and it was a really important tool on the FS7. One of the biggest joys of using Canon EF lenses with the FS7 was the Speed Booster and the normal adapter. If you wanted that field of view and look of full frame, you use the speed booster. If you needed the extra length on the lens and a super 35 mil look, use a normal adapter. It made the camera super flexible. I can hear you saying, we got your wish, Sony have made a full frame professional video camera with the FX9, so you don't need that anymore. Well, actually the speed booster is still a very useful tool to have in your arsenal. More for me, Tottenham Hotspur, more Man you, whatever it is that floats your boat especially until version 2 firmware comes out. So if you want that full frame aesthetic and slow motion in 4K, the only way you're going to do it is with a speed booster. But if you want to do this, you can't use your native glass, obviously. And as I've shown you, you can still get autofocus to work 
in slow motion if you shoot in 50p or 60p scan rate. So this brings me on to that question, which I have touched on a little bit already, is how well do adapted lenses work on the FX9, especially with autofocus? Because away from speed boosters, we have the normal type of adapters, which we will put in full frame mode and hope they will work really well with autofocus. I promise this will be my last section of obsessing over the autofocus, but I am just going to do this um, very controlled test using Natalie the mannequin. It's called Natalie after my sister, who uh, was a model in the late 80s, 90s, and early noughties. And I've used her before in a video about um, how to practice your lighting, because it's a great way of practicing your lighting. And I don't think I'd find anybody willing to be filming with me at quarter past 11 on a Friday night for the next two or three hours to get this done. So that's one athlete. And she's on the Rhino slider uh, with motorized head. So she's gonna rotate slightly and move backwards and forwards. Adding a few little conditions like rotating and seeing how it works. So what do you think Lollipop? This was to see how face tracking and just general autofocus worked with all these different types of lenses, native and adapted lenses to see at which point it would lose the face. The amount of variables was huge, from the different types of lenses, to the focus speed, the focus sensitivity, the focus area, face priority, face only, no face detection. The picture profiles, because the autofocus works much better when there's good contrast, because it uses that as well as face detection. From my experience so far, the autofocus still works really well in S-Log3 mode, just not as well as in a much contrastier profile like S-Cinetone. Then there's things like underexposure, overexposure, autoexposure, low base ISO, high base ISO. Just thinking about it now makes my head want to explode. I did my best. I didn't cover everything. That was impossible but hopefully just enough to get an idea of what works and what doesn't work. So what were my findings? Kind of obvious, really. The native glass worked way better in all the modes and even did pretty well using some of the slightly challenging setups in Cine EI mode. Adapted glass, the straight EF adapter and the Metabones both worked they just didn't like the face tracking that much. They weren't reliable. On normal mode, they were okay. But I must stress the okay. And autofocus that is okay isn't the same as autofocus that is great. And to get great results, you really do need to use native glass. Although going back to that Sigma 105 Arc, the 1.4, the EF version with the MC adapter did so well, maybe it's down to the fact that it's a newer lens. Some of the older Sigma lenses did well, and some I couldn't even get to work at all. I think it is down to firmware, but yeah. That 105 worked like a native lens. And don't forget, they do make E-mount lenses as well. I am sure their newer lenses like 35mm 1.2 will do just as well. Although without having one to test out, I am totally speculating.
Summarising my findings with the autofocus, which has been a big part of this video, there's a number of key things. First up, it does work really well, but it would work a lot better if you had a touch screen. The other key thing, or well, the other two key things, is your lenses, obviously, and your settings. So these are our key focus settings. We have the transition speed, the sensitivity, the area which it scans. The transition speed is how fast the motor will react. So forgive me if I keep looking over at the screen because it's where the menu is on my monitor on the Ninja 5. So I have it set to four right now. Um, you can see the difference if I have it set to fast. But what's important as well is the sensitivity to knowing when it's moving. So let's go to responsive. One of the key things, apart from your settings, is gonna be how good your lens is at this. You can see it's not, it got a bit thrown there. That's because it's not on any face tracking mode. And that definitely makes a difference because right now anything, because it's on super sensitive, anything I put close or it's gonna be in frame, it will switch to that which whilst is a is pretty cool and you can see how quick it is if you're doing something just on the face it's a bit of a nightmare you know even just something like your glasses but look how good it is look how fast it can be i mean look at that it is absolutely fantastic for certain things transition speed but the sensitivity is slow See what we have there is it's fast when it figures out there is something changing but it takes ages to realize that there is something more important that's not good this could be the optimum settings for this situation right now You know, it could be more reactive, but it feels a little bit more organic. Now with face priority, it will literally do what it says. Prioritize the face when it comes to autofocus. It's on me, I'm the biggest in the frame, it's gonna default to me. What happens though, and I do what we did before, it loses me and goes on to another face you can see. Then it comes back onto me because I'm biggest in the frame. So there's a couple of things we can try. So we can try face registration. So I'm gonna press enter and now I get a double white box. So now it will not be distracted by any other faces at all. So even if that face becomes bigger in frame, it will stay on me. But if I do this, it still does the same thing. Face priority will always default to a face, even if you have a registered face. What can you do about that? Well, that's when you go into face only. Hide my face. Don't do it. Don't do it. So it should not be distracted by any other faces, but what about objects? Hand, came onto me. Didn't go onto her, came onto me. Doesn't track though, right? Now, tracks my face, hand up in front. Didn't do it. Move all the way, really out of focus. The problem is I'm barely a face, I'm just a very, very out of focus blur. So in this sort of situation, just use your manual focus override here to give a helping hand. Because it, it is looking in the frame, it is looking to see what is the face, but if you're so blurred and so out of focus, you may need to actually help it. But this thing, how do we stop this happening if we just want it to be a face?
so I think this is a bug. Um, I'm pretty certain it's going to be fixed in firmware. Uh, I mean, I've already uh, given this information to Sony and sent them clips, so fingers crossed. It's not a massive thing, so I don't know how often you're going to go, hand! So you didn't do that, girl. Hand! Hand? Oh my god, I fixed it. It's fine now. Look! I don't know what I did. <laughs> oh, God's sake. I'm, I'm losing it. I can't do it anymore. I'm going into bloody manual focus mode. Where's the switch? Where's the switch? Give me the switch! So I gave my footage to Sony and they were very reassuring, saying that this is clearly not supposed to happen. And with all these examples, it's going to really help to figure out what's causing this issue so they can sort out the algorithm. So you will never have to go through the experience of what I had to go through. Because the thing is, the autofocus works brilliantly. It's just on a couple of really extreme situations that it goes a bit funny. My faith hadn't been lost at all in the autofocus. It's still absolutely amazing. I just need to remember if I'm doing any interviews using autofocus, I just need to make sure that whoever I'm interviewing doesn't suddenly put their hand up in front of the camera and go, hand! Otherwise, I'll be fine. It is very important that I touch upon this, although I do totally recommend going to Alistair Chapman's website and he can explain this stuff in way more technical detail than I ever could. Just want to give you a slight little guide, a taster for it. So we have two different ways of recording in the camera. We have custom and Cine EI mode. And I'm currently in custom in S-Log3. Now I wouldn't normally shoot S-Log3 in custom, I'm just using it for an example right now. You'll see that we have our base ISO set to low. This is ISO 800. If I press my shortcut button, which I program to change it to the high, it says 4000. So the noise levels at both of these should be very similar. So this is S Cinetone now. The dynamic range is much more challenging. You know, the 15 stops is actually in Cine EI mode, S Log 3. S Log 3 has a much higher dynamic range than we have in S-Cinetone. We're probably losing about three or four stops, maybe. So, looking at a waveform, you know, we're never going to hold everything. It's a very contrasty shot. You'll notice, though, that my base ISO now says 400. And we're going to my high, it says 2000. Just trying to remember, if you are in Cinetone, it's just going to be lower. Look, you could, if you want to, change your mode to dB. And then when you're in your low mode at 0 dB at the base ISO. So, But I, I just stick with ISO, it's kind of what I got used to. You can increase your ISO via standard switches on the side, low, medium and high, I've set them for a stop each. Uh, but they are user definable in the menus. But what I much rather do and recommend is using the multi-function dial and then no, no, select it in and then you can change it to what you want. So when you get to 4000 ISO and you go over, it's still in the low mode. You can go to 6400, which is not a good idea because it's going to be noisier than it can be. Because if we're in our high ISO, let's just drop back down again. We can't go below 4000, but we can go obviously much higher. I would love it if it could automatically switch, but it can't so you're stuck with it we do have lots more options in paint which are available in custom mode so you really can do all sorts of things to your image if you want to but that's totally up to you when you're in custom mode you can select s log 3 which is what i'm showing you right now but it doesn't give you the s gamma 3 color space I've been advised to use BT2020 to get the best results, but it's not going to match with any LUTs that are currently out there. So trying to get that Venice-y look color is going to be tricky. It's not saying it won't look good. It does still look good and the dynamic range is still definitely held. It just will be a bit harder to work with. And that's why I really would recommend shooting in Cine EI mode if you are going to shoot in S-Log3. So this is Cine EI mode. 
and it operates in a very different way to custom mode. If you've never shot with a camera this way before, well, hopefully you'll learn something. But again, go to Alistair Chapman's website for some very in-depth stuff. We have our low, base ISO of 800, and our high. So if I try and change the ISO right now, nothing happens. It doesn't even say ISO, it says EI, because that is the exposure index. So basically it records at two levels, 4000 and 800. And the idea is that you adjust your physical attributes to make that work at that exposure index. Well, I'm already wide open, so I can't affect that. I do have ND in, so I can turn the ND off. Yeah, we're pretty much there, just with that. And so I would hit record, and that's okay. Apart from the ND, the only things that are gonna affect the exposure will be your aperture, your shutter speed, if you really wanna to touch that, I wouldn't, and of course, your lighting. So you may think, oh, what a terrible way of working. What if I just wanna just, you know, bump up the exposure with the ISO a little bit. I don't, can't increase the lighting because it is what it is. Uh, and I'm already wide open, so what am I gonna do? Shooting in straight Cine EI mode is a bit like shooting in RAW, only when it comes to the ISO as such. So when you have the MLUT on and you're pushing up the ISO and you're seeing these changes, it won't look like that when you look at the recording, it will still be at the, the 4000 exposure index you just need to push that up in post the equivalent way it won't look any different because all you're doing in camera is just pushing up gain anyway the key is when you are shooting log you cannot be underexposed like this because when you're going to add gain in post it's going to look nasty and noisy this is the correct exposure pushed up in post in premiere it's noisy because it was underexposed to start with so now I'm going to add light to get correct exposure in camera first. You can see the difference in noise, it's huge. Just to show you how important it is to not underexpose this log image. What I've done here is I've recorded the viewing LUT internally to show you the noise level you get by doing it that way compared to doing it in post. You do have noise reduction available both in Cine EI and custom mode and the results aren't too bad, just be very careful because it could cause banding. To be honest with you, if you're in this sort of situation you can't increase the amount of light, I wouldn't be shooting in this mode. In extreme low light, custom mode does look better. This is the last thing I want to show you here. It's the importance of making sure that you are in the correct base ISO, whether it's low or high. It's a very simple rule. If you need to be pushing your ISO up, you need to be in the high, and when it's nice and bright, you stay in the low. If you start pushing up your ISO whilst in the low base sensitivity, it looks really noisy, as you can see here. So this is 4000 in the low base sensitivity, and this is 4000 in the high base sensitivity. You tell me, which one looks better? Ah, oh, rain, rain, rain. Nature's promised and anti-aliasing filter in certain situations. This is the problem I've had. When I've been trying to go out and do these tests is it's just been raining so much. But it does look like there's a bit of blue coming through. So I might get lucky because it was awful a minute ago and I need to get these slow motion tests done. I'm running out of time. What should be something really simple is actually quite complicated in a way. It's simple once you understand what's going on. It's just the way that it is presented. Hey, not by me, 
by the menus. In our record format menu, we have four options, frequency, imager scan mode, codec, video format. Frequency can vary from 23.98p, which is 24p, 25p, 29.97, 50, 59.97p. But that depends on the imager scan mode. But those are the basically the frame rates that we can record in. The sensor of the camera actually isn't even 16 by 9 or 17 by 9. It's 3 by 2. In fact, the pixels are almost exactly the same as the high-end Sony Venice camera. But the top and bottom are not touched by the camera. They're just completely ignored. How rude. Anything in blue, green or red is what is actually scanned by the FX9. So the highest imager scan mode is called FF6K. So that is full frame 6K. It's scanning 6K, but it's not recording 6K. It's down sampling to 4K. It can't record 6K for reasons which I'm not gonna get into right now. And in this mode, we can record anything from 24P, 25P, even 30P, that's it. If you want 50p or 60p, we need to drop down to super 35 mil crop, which is still 4K, but it's cropping the sensor. Don't be fooled by the menu showing you 50p and 60p when in full frame 6K, because when you select it and it changes the frequency to that, it will drop down to super 35. Bit of a tease, really. So there's basically two imager scan mode methods for you to record 4K. Full frame, and Super 35. It's when we get to HD is when it gets really confusing. So if you're in your imager scan mode of full frame 6K and you go down to video formats, you'll see you have the options of 4K and HD. The HD recording in the full frame 6K scan yields the nicest looking image by far. For HD that is. But it can only go up to 30p. So there's no slow motion in that mode. If you want slow motion in HD, you need to go down to the full frame 2K. Now this is not cropping because it says full frame. Other cameras will crop the sensor one to one to get high frame rates. To get those high frame rates, that 2K scan is scanning at a lower resolution. And that will mean a loss in detail. You won't see it all the time, it's just on certain types of shots, like if I crop in on these trees, you really can see the difference. That amount of detail will be the same whether you're shooting in high frame rate mode or you are shooting in normal speed. This actually isn't anything new, it's just the way that the menus operate is new. With the FS7, if we were in HD mode and we went to high frame rate, we would lose detail and we would get a noisier image. We drop back down to 25p, all within the same scanning mode, it would look so much better. Just with the FX9, we do really need to change our scanning mode to get that better 25p, because if we stay in that 2K full frame mode, our image quality won't be as good as it could be in normal speed. As the S and Q button when shooting in full frame, 6K HD, and it goes up to 30p, it makes it kind of pointless. It would be great if they could make it so when you press that button, it would change to full frame 2K. So we could get some HFR and then we we'll press it again, it goes back to full frame 6K HD. Be nice. The other thing is, by just going into full frame 6K scan mode, doesn't put you back into 4K. You still need to change your video format manually to 4K from HD. This is why those early shots you saw in Richmond, I was in HD. I really want Sony to look at this menu and relabel it so it's much, much clearer and these sort of things can't happen. Despite this, the 120p still does look good in slow motion. With some shallow depth of field, it looks very nice. Obviously, the reasons why these lights are flickering is because I'm being greedy and trying to shoot 120 frames per second in a 50 hertz country. And if I'd left it at 100 frames per second, I would have been fine. Oh well. 
let's just call it artistic flicker. The only time autofocus is available is when your frame rate matches your frequency. So if we're in 25p frequency and we're 25p, autofocus. But if we do slow and quick motion in our 4K mode to 30p, not much slow motion, autofocus disengages. And again, those frequencies are 24, 25, 30, 50, and 60p, but only in certain imager scan modes. Hopefully this makes you understand what's going on now. Well, that actually worked out kind of well. The rain gave the newly reopened Richmond Lock a nice sheen, so it looked really nice behind me, as you can see. Racking focus is so hard on these stills lenses, especially when you've gotten used to autofocus. Uh, but I don't need the whole thing. I need, you know, 120 frames. I need a small section of it, so that's yeah, not too bad. The thing is with things like, you know, the three by two sensor not being entirely used, uh, so we don't have any anamorphic mode, and no 6K recording any down sampled. To be honest with you, if the FX9 had most of the things that I want to be enabled on it, it would essentially be like a Sony Venice, but with really good autofocus. At some point, you just have to just accept it and love it for what it is, and not complain about what it isn't. As you can tell from how long you've been watching this, there is so much to cover in this camera and I'm still not going to be able to cover it all. One really fascinating feature which really needs its own video is the way it does stabilisation. I did a 50 minute video based upon action cameras and how they did it. And the FX9 in a way does it in a very similar way using gyroscopic data. There is no in-body image stabilization, as in no sensor stabilization, no electronic stabilization. The way that the FX9 stabilizes stuff away from optical stabilized lenses is by recording all the movement, all the gyroscopic data, and keeping that associated with each file. You then run it into their dedicated software called Catalyst Browser and then you stabilize it and you can set it for the amounts that you want. Results depend, of course, upon how much you're moving, your focal lengths, how much light there is, and your shutter speed. As I said, this is too big a topic for this video alone. It's something I will look into in much more detail and see how it compares with other methods of post stabilization. You've seen the FX9 I've been using in this video with all sorts of different bits and pieces on, but do you really need them? Is the camera that comes straight out the box not enough? Can you use it like it is? Well, actually, yes. Unlike the FS7, which had lots of really irritating little quirks that absolutely had to be fixed to make the camera usable, the FX9 is much better. I mean, first off, the LCD screen is high resolution, it's now 720p. So even though I don't like that loop that comes with it, same loop that we've had all the way back from the FS100, it is much more usable. You see me use the Zacuto Z Finder on that, but it does work very well, and it is much shorter than the official Sony loop. So it makes it much easier to have the camera on your shoulder. I know it's all money, but if you've got one from the FS7, I think it still works. In fact, a lot of accessories still work on the FX9, which is great. Depending on what your needs are, you may not need most of this stuff, but this is just what I've got, and I'm gonna to explain to you why I have put them on this camera. The number one accessory I would recommend getting is the Zacuto top plate. It's not that expensive, and all it does, it's not even really a top plate, it just places the bit at the front where your rod goes through. Now we did have lots of issues with the FS7 version of that, 
and even with the FSF Mark II version and this, it's still not great. There's still a screw in there that you need to unscrew if you want to change the position of that rod, which is silly. I don't want to have to get out any tools. I like my camera to be toolless. What I do not recommend is replacing that top handle. That top handle has the MI shoe and it has the zoom rocker, which I don't use, but the MI shoe I do use. That's two of your inputs on the audio. So don't replace that. I don't have a full cheese plate on there right now, but I do own one from Small Rig and that does work very well. The reason it's not on there is it didn't play very well with that Zakuto front top plate thing. It didn't fit on together. I did find a way of putting on a rod clamp for that EVF. It looked a bit ugly, but I am, I'm still working on it. Why do you even need a cheese plate? Well, there's no places to really put anything on. You've got a quarter 20 hole on the top of the handle and the ones on the body that there are are not ideal. It's very difficult to put any accessories on top of that camera without any third party cheese plate type things. I actually have a MOV cam slash move cam side plate and rear plate. They do the whole thing and it's wonderful. But the version I got was a pre-production version and it didn't quite fit. Whilst Sony have redesigned the shoulder pad slightly, it's still not ideal for shooting handheld. You just can't get the cam where it needs to be, which is the center of gravity on your shoulder. So I'm using the Zakuto VCT base plate here. It's very comfortable and it lets me slide it backwards and forwards so depending on what size lens I've got, I can get really lovely balance. And I know I've talked about Zakuto a lot, but uh, I do love their products. Not everything on here is Zakuto though. I use the best bits for me, hence my Franken rig. But I've been really good friends with them for many, many years. And they've actually very kindly have given anybody who wants to buy an FX9 accessory this discount code and it's valid forever. Well, as long as the Kuto are around. My FS7 uses the shape replacement arm. It gives you really quick adjustment, much better than the stock arm. But this is the Zakuto arm and I do prefer it. It's easy to adjust like the shape one, but it has a big improvement, which I find essential. You're able to rotate the whole arm so you can get it to settle in the natural position of where your wrist will be. Whereas the other arms, you force your wrist to be where the actual arm is. This is so much better and way less strain. I am using a dedicated EVF here. So this is the Chameleon Pro. This one has the ability to have 3D LUTs, so you could use your M LUTs in there. So you can shoot in Cine AI, you can load up your M LUT in there, and then you can flick between the two, and you can monitor your waveform for what's being recorded and what you're seeing. And it also shows things like audio levels and stuff. It has false color and peaking and waveform. And I have their Axis Mini arm on there, which gives me a lot of flexibility for moving that EVF into the right position. So of course, by having the EVF, my LCD screen doesn't have a place to go at the front. I still want to use it and I've moved it to the back. This is the best place I've found for it so far. Uh, I can't think of anywhere else to put it right now, but it seems to work. You can flip it around so assistants can see things and change settings and you can flip it yourself, of course, and you can flip it down to protect it, even though I do have a pouch which goes over it when it goes in the bag. And if Sony ever do enable a touch screen, oof, I think it's a perfect place for it. I have actually changed the mic bracket and my God, if you've ever tried to take it off, it is insanely complicated. So what I'm using right now is a very simple one from Small Rig. Uh, I don't think it's great. It doesn't seem to have a lot of isolation, but for now it'll do. I think I can find something better. And I'm using a Rode NTG5 microphone there, which is uh, superb. Here's some nice audio accessories for you. I don't have the UWPD, which is their digital wireless receiver yet, but I do have their old dual receiver one. You don't need any extra power. You don't need any extra cables. Everything goes to the MI shoe. So with this dual receiver, 
I have two channels of audio, which I can control within the camera, or if I have a single receiver, obviously one. It's a neat, lovely system, and it gets rid of some of those cables. And if you get Sony's XLR K3M, which is mainly for their stills cameras, but it works well on here. What it does, it gives you two more XLR inputs with full phantom power. And it also gives you an MI shoe extension cable. You can't buy this on its own, but it comes with this. So you could use that to mount your radio mics at the back or anywhere else if you want to. This little microphone is very cool. It's the, again from Sony, it's the ECM B1M. And what's unique about this mic, well, it's two unique things. It has three switchable polar patterns in one microphone. Super directional, unidirectional, and omnidirectional. And it also has noise cancellation, which is okay. I wouldn't use it too much. I've used it in planes, trains, and automobiles. Actually, not the trains. And it does take away that rumble. So it is there. You can do it in post though and you'll have more control. But it's, it's a cool thing to have. We're almost there. I just want to talk to you about power. Now, the camera uses the BPU batteries, and the camera is more power hungry than before. It has a power draw of about 16 watts. It'll use up your batteries from the FS7 maybe a third quicker or so. You can buy bigger third-party batteries. I have some 95 watt hour ones. Now, you have two ways of getting more power. Sony's extension unit is great in that it gives you the ability to use external power, gives you raw out, and also lets you put in these new radio mics. But the problem is it is very expensive and it is very big. Here are a few alternatives from Wooden Camera, from Movecam, from Hawkwoods, and from Core SWX. They all need to do a similar thing because the camera needs 19.5 volts DC inputs. From what I understand, this is down to an excess of old VIO power supply units that they've reconditioned, good for the environment and all that. Which means all of these adapters need to up the voltage from the battery to that level. And the downside is, because you're going into a DC in, in the viewfinder when you're using your external power, it looks like you're actually powering off the mains. So you won't know exactly how much power you got left. A couple of the adapters do have a warning light on, but you're not really gonna see them. All of the adapters do let you have a BP battery in. The wooden camera one will let you have any size. The others, maximum a BP35. This is important. By having that battery in there, when your main battery dies, it will instantly switch that BP battery. You'll see it in the viewfinder, so you know it's time to change the battery. To take that BP battery out and replace it and charge it, the wooden camera is easiest because it is just a lever open. The others will require screwing. That is why I do recommend replacing any of the screws that come with them with thumb screws so it's easier to replace those batteries. My two favorites are probably the wooden camera one because of that ability to put any battery in and the Core WX one because it is so neat. Both the move cam and the core give you the ability to use a four pin XLR input instead of the standard inputs that comes with the camera. These adapters are essential. It gives you power out for things like EVFs and monitors, and it makes your camera last longer. So there we go, I've just cost you thousands. God, I'm an idiot. Wasting time here. I'm being forgetful. Dad, I thought you were kind of nervous. Put another card in now. Literally like 50 minutes of light left. Just get what I can. Try and shoot in uh, Cinetone and S Log 3. Uh, I'm gonna stop the long lens because I can see something interesting. The time I had with the camera went very, very quickly, far too quickly. A lot of time was spent just fiddling with it and getting to know it, spending too much time with the autofocus. And the weather had been atrocious for the entire fortnight. Every time I wanted to go out, it was pouring with rain.
I so wanted to get some lovely daytime sunny shots. Didn't happen. But I felt within that fortnight, I got to know the camera pretty well. I wouldn't say all of my questions about the camera had been answered. In fact, I'd probably come up with about 10 times more questions than when I started with. When I'm trying to assess a camera like this in such a concentrated amount of time, it is difficult. As I said, the FS7 review was five months in the making. So by the time I put that video out, I really knew the camera. And I'd spent so much time of this two weeks trying to understand the camera and not enough time shooting with it, which really, for me, is the biggest test. I really did find the camera an absolute pleasure. I found the image to be absolutely beautiful. There was so much that I absolutely loved about it. I certainly wasn't disappointed by the main things that I came into this video looking at, which was a beautiful full frame image, and it has a beautiful full frame image. Much better low light performance and great autofocus, these were the main things. Especially knowing what's coming out with the firmware in version 2, I did have this feeling though that the resolution and frame rates were nothing to get excited about, because these are frame rates and resolutions that I had back in the F55. It is a 6K sensor, but you can't record the 6K, so it downsamples it, and that does give it a cleaner looking image. Would I also like the opportunity, if it was available, to choose to record 6K? Yeah, absolutely. The problem is, the XAVCI codec does not support a resolution over 4K DCI. It does not support frame rates over 4K 60p. So I do think this is a big factor as to why we aren't seeing these higher frame rates and higher resolutions. The camera is certainly capable of doing it. I mean, after all, one of the firmware updates to come in version two is 120 frames per second in 4K. It's just not internal. It's only gonna be fire raw out via there large extension back which I don't have who knows maybe there is a version of 3 firmware coming which does let us use CF Express cards has a new codec enable 6k internal recording and also high frame rates of 120 frames per second in 4k I don't even know if the camera's processor is capable of those sort of resolutions and frame rates I just feel that we do need to have a bump up in our frame rates and resolutions from the FS7. And the reality is, most of the stuff that I shoot is real time. Slow motion is just occasional. The 6K I most definitely would love to have for when I'm shooting interviews, for reframing and punching in a bit closer. But as soon as I start filming with the camera and looking at that image, these sort of things just go completely to the back of my mind because I absolutely adore the footage that comes out of this camera. The stuff tonight has just turned out so well, way nicer than I ever could have imagined it would be. Certainly when I arrived with just an hour of daylight left, it was even nice daylight, there was no sun, it was just cloud, and then it started drizzling, and I really thought that was it, and I wasn't going to get anything nice, but there's so many colours around here. And his camera can see in the dark, it can see so well, it's just beautiful. You combine it with you know, fast lenses, it works incredibly well. But even with the 2.8 70-200, pushed up the ISO, I think the highest I went to was maybe 10,000, and it looked great. But most of the time it was lower than that, just getting some amazing colours and just absolutely beautiful. You can get it straight out of the camera looking fantastic, but you can shoot and log and get it to look like that anyway, which is obviously going to give you a better dynamic range. There is that downside that the autofocus doesn't work as well when you are shooting in log because it has the phase detection part for the speed and it uses contrast-based autofocus for the accuracy and there's less contrast when you're shooting in log. It still works, it's just not as 
well, not, I mean, it's incredible when you have the, some contrast in there. It's absolutely incredible. As you've seen tonight, it's just been following ducks and people perfectly. It's amazing. I'm pretty sure I've used all of the buttons on the camera, which is good because if there was ones which I wasn't using, that would be a waste of space. You can customize most of them to different functions and I thoroughly recommend you do that. I can't tell you exactly how you should set it up because that comes down to you. I'm certainly saving my setup on the SD card so the next time I use an FX9, I can remap them straight away onto the buttons that I need them to be. I've got one of the buttons set up to switch between the low and high base ISO, which I'm constantly switching between. Now you do have the switches for the gain or the ISO at the bottom uh, of the camera and they can be preset in the menu but they can't change the base ISO you either go into the menu press this button which is a lot easier three of the buttons are set up just for autofocus and I could actually do with another one to be honest with you one of them is set up to change the type of autofocus whether it is uh, face priority uh, face only and face off, not the Nicolas Cage John Travolta movie, just uh, it won't get distracted by faces when it's doing its autofocus. The other one is to change the area where it is looking to keep things in autofocus. So it's a wide zone and selectable area. And the other button I have set for focus hold. So if somebody's coming towards me or I, I, I want to override autofocus and just pause it, I can hold that button down. Absolutely essential. Now some lenses have this button on there, but a lot of lenses don't. To be honest with you, I just want it on the body. So I'm not adding any extra wobble, which is what you do if you're gonna press a button on a lens at the end of a shot. The other settings I use a lot for focus, but not as much as these ones, is the changing the sensitivity and the transition speed between things. Uh, you do need to change those depending on the type of thing you're shooting, but nowhere near as frequently as the other ones. So it's in the user menu, it's pretty easy to get to and I have it quite near the top. One thing I haven't talked about is one of the features that I'm so happy is in the camera when it comes to audio. It does record audio really well of course because it's a proper video camera, but we have, I think it's eight channels of audio available with XAVCI. But the key thing is we have four inputs. Now we've had other cameras with four inputs and two of them via the uh, MI shoe on the top. But one thing I've never been able to do, well, I used to be able to do this back in my original Betacam SP 30 years ago, I could replicate channels one and two on three and four at different levels. And that's a nice safety way of recording audio. So I can have, say, channel one set to a radio mic and then channel three is set to replicate that, but just maybe six dB low in case somebody starts shouting or have one on auto, for example. It's a lovely, safer way of recording audio. And it's not been in the other cameras and I've asked and asked and asked and asked and it is now in here. And it makes me very happy to have that on there. So on that note, note, audio, sort of ties in together slightly. I am going home to warm up. I am so cold. It's nowhere near as cold as it was the other day, but it's wet. I've been outside for hours and I'm sitting on a park bench and it's soaked through me. I just need to change clothes and get warm. So I'm gonna leave you with some last images of this beautiful evening, despite it being cold and wet in Richmond upon Thames.
And that brings us to today, the 12th of February, 2020. Down in Whitstable in Kent, for some filming with version one firmware, or the FX9. And look, some sun. We've only got a couple of hours left, of course. It's enough to get a little bit of different looking footage. This review was only supposed to be a first look with the two weeks that I had of the camera back in November. But as things changed and I had more time with a release camera, then I had more time to really explore this camera and get to know it much better. Which of course is much more useful than any first look review. I just never imagined that I would spend so much time making this. Everything that I came across that was new on the camera, I wanted to know more about how to get the best results. Of course, autofocus was a massive part of that, but it wasn't the only thing. So there's still many aspects that I would love to explore, especially the post stabilization. That would be fascinating. And of course, version two firmware. And who knows what other firmware is coming out. Some people will say they should have just waited to release the FX9 when version two was ready. I disagree. Version 1 of the FX9 is a magnificent camera. I know some people might be put off and away by the full frame because they don't see the 35mm lenses like I do with the Fujinon MK zooms, which are amazing lenses, and think, well, I'm not going to be able to use them. Well, no, you won't be able to use them in full frame. The Super 35mm mode is still beautiful. The colours are gorgeous, the noise is so much more reduced than the FS7. It's a beautiful camera in Super 35. I, for one, will still be using my MKs in that mode. I think I've got some pretty nice stuff. Well, no, I know I've got some pretty nice stuff. The only thing is that side of the beach where I was in daylight isn't as interesting visually as this side, but I still got some nice shots and it's a good test of the autofocus with the release firmware. I don't know if it's improved because I could really do with a side-by-side -side with the pre-production one, but it, it worked so well. And uh, good test of the dynamic range with the different picture profiles. And here, it looks great, even though it's really dark, I'm at 12,800 ISO and I'm now switched to S-Cinetone. And it's gorgeous with this fast lens I have here, which is the Sigma 105 1.4 Art. Um, it's the EF version with the Sigma MC11 adapter and it works great, the autofocus works great, it picks up things I don't even know how it knows what to pick up. So, so clever. The autofocus is just it's just great but it's absolutely freezing cold so it's gonna get the last few shots and i'm gonna drive however long that will take me but it was worth coming out here it's definitely definitely as it stands right now with its beautiful full frame image and incredible colors amazing autofocus and terrific low light Taking into account all of those factors, this truly is the best camera I've ever filmed with. I've certainly been frustrated at times with the many quirks of the camera and the way that it operates. At times it is counterintuitive. I do feel that there's sometimes a lack of common sense in the way that things are done. I know they can be improved. I would love them to take on board some of the things that I've said in this review. It doesn't hold the camera back at all. It just means that your first experiences in first few days with the camera are gonna be a little bit more frustrating than perhaps they need to be. In a way, it's a bit like a person. Once you get to know them a bit better, 
their little quirks and their ways of doing things. It's not going to stop you falling in love with them. And of course, with the biggest difference being that you are actually going to be pointing out the little irritations and hope with time they can work on them. Every story should have an ending, even a review. What do I think of the FX9? Is it an FS7 replacement? Is it worth it? Well, you know the camera I've been using today? That's mine. Thank you.